Welcome to the ConderVultures.com podcast with your host, Peter Zalewski, a Miami real estate broker, Wall Street consultant, and expert witness. This podcast is focused on identifying real estate buying opportunities in the South Florida condo market, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. The ConderVultures.com podcast is not authorized by the South Florida real estate industry and will most likely annoy many of the region's talking heads. This podcast will feature straight talk and salty language that could be offensive to some. Please remember that part <sighs> past investment success does not determine future gains, especially in South Florida's volatile condo market. For more information, please visit condovultures.com. Welcome to Miami Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Zalewski from Condo Vultures. If you're tuning in for this podcast, you're here for the Reporters Roundtable. It is a discussion by current and former journalists talking about some of the biggest headlines that have occurred within the last week or so. Who decides what the big stories are? I do. I was a journalist for 13 years, worked for a variety of different publications. Now I do real estate, I do consulting. I also do some brokerage, primarily on the buy side. But what I miss is being in that journalism world and I miss trying to go for the straightforward answer. Way too much of the information that's put out there right now. A little bit too much hyperbole, a little bit too much embellishment for me. So what we do is every week we bring together current and former journalists, kick around some big headlines that I've chosen, and we will discuss it. And the idea is to help you get through uh, hyperbole and the embellishment that's sort of out there. So who do we have for this particular week uh, on the podcast? We're going to have John Fackler. John was a journalist uh, for more than 20 years. He wrote about white collar crime. He wrote about uh, business. He also did a restaurant review. Mr. Fackler, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, they can send an email to your easy to remember email address, which is jtfny2 at gmail.com. Let me repeat that, jtfny2 at gmail.com. Mr. Fackler, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Peter. Glad to be back. Great. Fantastic. Glad to have you back. We also have Jean Gruss. Jean was a journalist for 25 years. 20 years of which was local state of Florida. Jean right now has a public relations marketing firm called Gruss Communications. If you want to reach him on his website, go to grusspr.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. Mr. Gruss, how's it going? You're traveling the world. I'm looking on social media. I see you diving and you're seeing sharks, crocodiles, and all kinds of beautiful landscape. Um, I, I, how you been and how's, how's life as a world traveler? <laughs> so that's great to be back with you, Peter. Uh, Made sure I was back for your podcast. Uh, much appreciated. Much appreciated. And then our rotating journalist this week is a woman who is the residential real estate bureau chief. That's Catherine Kalurgis. She works over at The Real Deal. Catherine, people want to get a hold of you. Your email is kk@therealdeal.com. kk@therealdeal.com. Mr. Fackler, take a hit. Make it nice and simple. That would be my <laughs> recommendation to you. Catherine, how you been? Long time no see. I feel like it's been a whole pandemic. I'm good. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing well. Tell the audience. People are going to remember you and your insight. Tell them what happened. You got a new title. I did, yeah. So I'm working with our residential real estate reporters across our markets um, and helping guide cross-market coverage of, you know, big trends and issues that the industry is facing. That's fantastic. And I saw that the publisher of The Real Deal recently put up on social media that it's the 20-year anniversary of the publications. So yeah. uh, congratulations to you. Congratulations to The Real Deal. We hope you keep doing what you're doing because you're bringing some straight talk to a market that I like to say is filled with embellishment. But you're not going to get that here on this podcast. If you want to watch this podcast, most of you are probably listening to it on the traditional platform. Now we give you the video capability. Uh, feel free to check us out anywhere video is possible, such as Spotify. We also have all our podcasts posted on YouTube. Handle is Condo Vultures TV, Condo Vultures TV. And I'd also suggest if you have any comments for us, you want to compliment, you want to criticize, send an email to inquiry at condovultures.com, I-N-Q-U-I-R-Y at condovultures.com. All comments we receive, we're going to go ahead, we'll read in the subsequent uh, Reporters Roundtable podcast, and we'll kick it around. So uh, don't worry, we have thick skins and we encourage you to write us or even send us a video or an audio via email and we'll embed it into this particular podcast. We're going to go ahead. We'll take our commercial, first commercial break. On the other side of the break, we're going to get into our first three stories. It's a simple formula, and it works. Buy low, sell high. We're Condo Vultures, and when it comes to your real estate, we help you buy low. 
At Condo Vultures, we represent the buyer, and now's the time to buy. Log on to condovultures.com for more information. Condovultures.com. And remember, before you sell high, you have to buy low. Featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, 60 Minutes, and Time Magazine. Condo Vultures Realty, a licensed Florida real estate brokerage capitalizing on the condo correction since 2006. Welcome back to the Miami Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm Peter Saluski of Condo Vultures. This is our reporter's roundtable. We're going to get into our first three stories that I handpicked. I'm going to read the headline. I'm going to read the first couple graphs. Then I'm going to ask one of our journalists to go ahead and provide some insight and some straight talk for you, the listener, hoping that if you are in the industry as a professional, if you are an investor or if you're somebody just sort of watching from the sidelines uh, to try to figure out what's going on in the marketplace, that you're going to be able to get some great insight. So, John Fackman, we're going to go to you for our first story. First story is going to come out of the Wall Street Journal. Let me read you the headline in the next couple graphs and then ask you to comment. Headline, is now a good time to sell your home? Again, coming from the Wall Street Journal. First couple graphs. If you're serious about selling your home now, don't get greedy with the asking price. This is still a seller's home market as there simply aren't enough affordable homes for sale in many parts of the country. But with average 30-year mortgage rates above 6%, buyers are much more price sensitive than they were a year ago. Agents and brokers say price is the most important thing for sellers to worry about right now. Pricing it too high a year ago often didn't backfire as prices were surging broadly. Doing that now could scare off many buyers in a vastly different market. Agents and housing economists say homeowners trying to sell now need to accept they're probably not going to get the same price their neighbor did early last year when mortgage rates were hovering around 3%. Mr. Peckler, uh, you've been down here since the 1980s. You own some property. Um, you went through the Great Recession. Uh, things have changed. You have changed. What is going on right now and what insight and uh, can you offer to this suggestion by the Wall Street Journal piece? And, and, and what's your take on it? Well, you know, people have to remember it's still a seller's market. I mean, let's, let's not forget that, but it's a drastically different seller's market where it is now it's about price, 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 price. And that really wasn't the case a year ago. A year ago, we had interest rates at about 3%. Now they're 6% and climbing. Um, you know, right now they're uh, advising to do more recent comps instead of looking at a six month comp, do much more recent comps uh, before you start to set your price. So uh, really, uh, the suggestion is, um, uh, you know, from uh, for agents and brokers uh, to their clients is don't screw around with the price. That's vastly different from last year. Um, don't know if that's going to continue, but I just got a gut feeling it might. Interesting, interesting. So story number two, Jean, we're going to go to you for this one. This one's coming from CNBC, the headline, mortgage demand from home buyers drops to a 28-year low, nearly three-decade low. First couple are the, the three key points that CNBC puts out when it publishes a piece. Uh, point number one, mortgage demand fell for the third straight week as interest rates increased. Point number two, mortgage applications to buy a home dropped 6% last week from the previous week. And point number uh, three, mortgage rates have moved half a percentage point higher in the past month. Mr. Gruce, as rates go up, I'm guessing not as many people can afford to buy what they ultimately want to buy. Uh, what say you and what's the impact of this particular movement in rates, as well as this story from CNBC? Yeah, I mean, the whole refinancing boom is over, basically. So you've taken that whole part of the market out. And, that, and then the other part is that, um, you know, uh, uh, the bond markets uh, come to the realization that inflation is here to stay. And uh, so they've driven prices down on uh, longer term treasuries like the 10 year on which mortgage rates are based. So uh, 10 year treasury now starting uh, to yield uh, in excess of 4%. That's driving up interest rates. Um, I was just checking interest rates um, earlier today uh, and uh, it looks like uh, Florida is sort of getting to the mid sevens uh, for, for some, uh, some, you know, credit worthy borrowers. So, um, and I don't think uh, that's going to end soon. So uh, inflation's here to stay. The Federal Reserve is determined to tame inflation. And um, we're going to see bond yields uh, keep rising, I think. Uh, and that's going to lead to higher mortgage uh, mortgage interest rates. And of course, you know, that's going to be, have a significant impact. I, I must say Southeast Florida is somewhat of a bit of a insulated from that in that um, we, we do have a very high percentage of cash buyers. So I think that um, uh, traditionally uh, the cash buyers, obviously they don't need financing. So mortgage rates really don't impact them. Uh, but South, Southeast Florida and South Florida, um, generally um, uh, many of the buyers in recent years have been uh, all cash buyers. So 
mortgage rates may not have the same impact that they do in other parts of the country. Interesting. Interesting. That's a great point, Sean. Catherine, let's go to you with story number three. Uh, this is actually a piece you wrote for the real deal. Let me read you the headline. I would read the first couple of graphs. I realize it's your piece, so you probably can't offer any opinion, but you can give us some insight, which I think the audience will find achievable. So um, headline, condo insurance crisis in South Florida could push owners to sell. First couple of graphs, at Jade Wins, a condominium complex over 900 units. Some owners, including retirees, have had to pick up part-time jobs to pay their skyrocketing homeowners association fees. The property made up of nine condo buildings, four pools, some ponds, and one long uh, shuttered community tower outside of North Miami Beach is one of many across South Florida struggling to stay afloat due to huge increases in insurance costs. Built between the late 1960s and early 1970s, Jade Wins is now paying a $3.9 million property insurance bill, up nearly 300% compared to last year. The complex's total insurance, including general liability and directors and officers policies, comes out to about $4.5 million in fiscal year 2022-2023. Catherine, wow, how are some of these owners absorbing uh, this increased cost? And are they going to be able to live in their houses and, or, or in their condos? And what other insight could you tell us from reporting out this piece? Sure. So I think this the, that particular community is an extreme example of um, what's been going on. But basically, like insurance has been on the rise for a long time, but with the Surfside collapse, um, hurricanes, other things that are contributing to it just kind of skyrocketing. And then you add in the fact that like a lot of these buildings are trying to um, do the repairs they need to, to to meet these new like recertification requirements mm -hmm. because of the collapse. Um, they have special assessments they're dealing with. A lot of these people, they've been deferring their reserves. They're on fixed incomes. So it's just kind of like all these things happening at once. And I think that some people will have to sell. And because these communities have issues, they they may not make as much money as they used to, you know, so they may have to, they may lose money. Um, they're picking up jobs, they're taking out loans. Like it's, it's pretty, it's pretty sad. It's a pretty like scary situation, but developers as usual and investors are kind of ready to kind of pounce on a lot of these communities. Wow. And, and Catherine, one follow-up question to that, um, obviously, uh, Many people are aware of the disaster which happened in Surfside with the uh, collapse of the Champlain Tower South Tower. Nearly 100 people were uh, died in that disaster. Roughly about a billion dollar settlement was paid out to the families of, of the victims. How much of an impact um, did that collapse of one building? And granted, it was a horrible story. How much of, a, uh, of an impact would, would you guess uh, that had on um, residents and owners of uh, condos at the Jade Wins that you're talking about in your story? I would say a big impact, you know, because a lot of the legislation that was passed in response to the collapse is the reason that these associations are having to fully fund their reserves, um, meet their recertification requirements, whereas before it was overlooked or you could waive it. Yep. Uh, now nobody wants another collapse on their hands. So that's that's why this is happening. Wow. 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 What, 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 a, what a great piece. Um, we're going to go ahead. We'll take a commercial break. Other side of the break, we're going to get into our next three stories. This is Peter Zalewski of the Condo Vultures podcast. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And I wanted to alert you that if you uh, have a property that you're looking to sell in the Tri-County South Florida area, I would encourage you to reach out to Jenny Horta, a licensed real estate broker with CVRRealty.com. She's my partner. She's been in the business for uh, north of 15 years. More importantly, she knows the market. She knows how to get a deal done. And she also realizes that it's more important to get a price that you can accept and sell the property rather than to hold firm on some price that's never going to be achieved and ultimately languish on the market. So if you're looking to do, do a deal that you want a skilled expert who can help you sell a property, reach out to Jenny Hortis at 305-865-5859, 305-865-5859, or visit her website, cvrrealty.com. Welcome back to the Miami Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Zaluski of Condo Vultures. This is our Reporters Roundtable. It's a weekly event where we bring together current former journalists, talk about some of the biggest stories that occurred in the real estate market in the uh, Tri-County South Florida region. I can't pick these stories, and I'm asking the journalists to give us their insight uh, uh, as to these stories. John Fackler, we're going to go to you with this story. This is coming out of the business online publication called The Insider. And let me read you the headline, and I'm going to read you the first couple graphs. Headline. Why your rent is about to fall. Subhead, tenants are finally gaining power in the housing market. And Mr. Fackler, first couple graphs. It's been a painful couple of years for renters. Discounts from early in the pandemic for those lucky enough to nab them eventually gave way to hefty rent hikes. 
Lines for apartment viewing stretch for city blocks and bidding wars erupted. Across the country, the rallying cry remained the same. The rent is too damn high. Look closely, though, and you'll see that 2023 is shaping up to be the, the year that tenants claw back bargaining power from landlords. It may not feel that way just yet, but double-digit rent increases and eye-watering lease demands are now a thing of the past. RealPage, a real estate software company, declared in a report last month that the market has rapidly shifting in favor of renters, a rise in the number of empty apartments, a decline in the number of people looking for a place of their own, and a coming influx of apartment supply will force landlords to compete more fiercely for tenants. And when landlords compete, tenants win. Mr. Fackler, uh, you're a renter today. Are you winning? <laughs> well, consi <laughs> considering, <laughs> considering my new landlord just raised my rent a hundred bucks, that, that, that kills that whole thesis. No, kidding aside, um, 2023 will be the year of the renter. Uh, they're talking about, uh, there was an interesting nugget in the story saying that they expect the first decrease in rental prices since the Great uh, Recession, which was, what, 07, 08. Um, there's just a perfect storm of, of things that are causing landlords to be too competitive. Like you mentioned earlier, people are not moving. There's not a lot of people moving into places. A lot of people are staying still. They don't, they're afraid to move because of the economy. They're afraid to sign new leases. But, I, but add to that something that was not considered was that you have one, two, three years of new construction of rental buildings, which is going to put more inventory on the street. So now, uh, you know, what's going to happen is you got landlords fighting with each other to give breaks, price, price breaks. Maybe there'll be some free um, parking. There'll be other um, things going on. So, um, you know, look for this to happen sooner than later. I think it'll probably be uh, 2023 uh, that you'll start to see this trend. Interesting, interesting. Ma makes me wonder what's going to go down first, rents or prices. So next story, John Gruce, let's go to you. Uh, this piece is coming out of USA Today, and I'm going to read you the headline. I'll read you the first couple of graphs, and I'll ask you to comment. Headline, new home inventory is up 115%. That's 115 as builders try to push Americans into buying a new house. And first couple of graphs, a combination of declining mortgage rates, reduced home prices, and incentives provided by home builders helps spur home sales in January. Sales of newly built single family homes in January increased to 670,000 seasonally adjusted annual rate. This was 7.2% higher than the 625,000 units sold in December, according to newly released data from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as U.S. Census Bureau. The latest, U uh, latest housing market index, which checks the pulse of single family housing market through a monthly survey of the National Association of Home Builders, found that 57% of builders were using incentives to bolster sales, including providing mortgage rates buy-downs and offering price reductions. Mr. Gruss, is that enough, these discounts on, um, uh, on uh, buying down mortgage rates as well as offering price reductions? Is that enough to get people off the sidelines and into some of these brand new houses, which are at sky-high prices? What say you? Well, I mean, I think January was a bit of an aberration because there was a dip in mortgage rates uh, towards the end of the year right. and the beginning of this year, and rates are back up again. So, yeah. um, uh, and I, I would expect home builders to uh, provide more incentives as mm -hmm. the year progresses. Uh, they've, they've been in a mad rush to build inventory in, um, you know, especially out West uh, in, in places that are, that have a lot of land and, um, uh, Florida, Southeast Florida is a bit unique uh, because we're landlocked, so there's not a lot of land. And um, so, you know, there'll be less competition and I would expect fewer incentives in Southeast Florida. However, in the rest of Florida, where there's lots of land available, say uh, north and uh, east of Tampa, for example, or um, east of uh, Naples and Fort Myers, more inland, I think you're gonna see um, uh, home builders uh, provide more incentives. Uh, Flor Florida is a little bit of a, an exception in this, uh, but I think it's not far behind the rest of the country, uh, uh, particularly in places like Texas and Arizona, where there's been a, a tremendous um, home building boom. And now uh, these builders are stuck with a lot of inventory. And I think we're going to see, um, we're going to see more than, I mean, if there's one thing home builders hate is lowering prices. So they're going to do everything to give you incentives, uh, such as mortgage buy downs, and, um, you know, upgrades uh, to uh, the interiors of your home, uh, things like that. Uh, but eventually, I think uh, prices will have to drop. I like the sounds of that. Like the sounds of that. Speaking of dropping, uh, Catherine, I'm going to go to you with story number six. This is coming out of The Real Deal. 
And I'll read you the headline. I'll read you the first couple of graphs. Headline, Miami development site prices nosedive. Subhead, price per acre dropping to $19 million in the fourth quarter after peaking at $40 million in the second quarter. First couple of graphs. At this time last year, Miami developer Harry Hernandez found himself in a tough seller's market as he competed with out-of-state high-rise builders for land deals in the city. Harvey's quoted as saying, it was difficult to do a deal. Expectations were much higher than we thought land values were. Even if we found something that made sense, the pricing and the conditions were very aggressive. You had to go uh, hard right away and close super fast. But over the second half of 2022, Hernandez says he's witnessed a remarkable change in attitude from the sellers of development site. Now they're willing to negotiate five to 10% discounts and or better terms. They understand the market in general has gotten more challenging. Catherine, what, what, what is your take of that? Um, according to the piece written by Francisco Alvarado, who's on our podcast, um, what, what, what's your take uh, as to what's going on? Are we past the peak of condo prices? Are we added downward? Uh, because uh, uh, land sellers can't unload their properties. And this may be a harbinger of lower condo prices in the future, because if you buy the land for less, therefore you should be able to sell it for less. Right. What say you? I think it's it's definitely like a situation where, where we passed the peak of land pricing for sure. Um, and it was there were already signs of it last year. You know, you had out-of-state developers coming in, paying crazy pricing for sites, not knowing honestly, how it works down here. And I heard from brokers who said that they were doing deals where it just didn't even, it didn't pencil out last year. So I think, you know, what you're going to see is land is going to continue. A lot of land will continue to be land. You know, these developers will have to wait because construction costs are so high. Insurance is so high. You know, every labor is expensive. Um, they can't get a construction loan right now. So I think it's just where we are in the cycle. And eventually, you know, it'll come back up again. I don't know if it'll be that expensive or maybe it'll be more expensive, you know, because of other things. But um, yeah, people always forget that it like the, the party ends. So it's speaking of a party ending last time. And this is a tidbit for some of our newly arrived um, residents, whether you come from the state of New York or California or any of these other places. In a couple of years, when you're driving around, and you see a lot of green space. Those are not parks. Those are development sites that never got constructed upon. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to take a commercial break. Other side of the break, I'm going to ask our journalists to go ahead and give us an outlook um, as we enter into March and the end of the first quarter. So we'll be right back. This is Peter Zaluski of the Condo Vultures podcast. Before I started doing these podcasts, I've been in the business of being a licensed real estate broker, a contributing columnist for the Miami Herald, as well as the Miami Real Deal, but also extra witness work in consulting. So... If you are looking for an expert witness or if you're looking for consulting services, a straight talk perspective as to what's going on in a particular marketplace, a building, or the, what happened previously for whatever your situation is, whether you are an attorney, whether you are an institutional fund looking to invest, or whether you're a lender who's trying to come up with some sort of a strategy and approach for your lending committee going forward, I don't just want to be able to help you to get a hold of me. Please reach out to Peter at condovultures.com. That's Peter at condovultures.com. Or give me a call to the office at 305-865-5859. 305-865-5859. Welcome back to the Miami Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Felusky from Condo Vultures. We discussed six articles that I handpicked that I thought were interesting and could offer some insight as to what's going on in the real estate market. We asked our former and current journalists to go ahead and give us some insight. Now we're going to ask them to go ahead and provide us some parting thoughts of wisdom. In the future, we will be using this particular uh, portion of our podcast to discuss your email. So if anybody has any comments out there, you want to criticize, you want to compliment, send an email to inquiry at condovultures.com, I-N-Q-U-I-R-Y at condovultures.com. I will add, if you want to send us an audio or a video um, comment, go ahead and email it to us and we'll go ahead and we'll incorporate it and embed it into uh, this particular podcast. And again, by the way, if you're listening to this podcast on a traditional platform, uh, we are available on video if you go to a platform that allows for it, such as Spotify, or you can go to YouTube where our handle is Condo Vultures TV, Condo Vultures TV. So that being said, let's go ahead and ask our journalists for some parting thoughts of wisdom. We're going to start with Jean Bruce. We'll then go to Catherine Kalergis, and then we're going to wrap it up with uh, John Fackler. Jean Bruce, um, uh, here we are beginning of March. Uh, what are your words of wisdom for our audience pertains to the South Florida real estate market and or the economy? 
Yeah, I think we really need to keep a close eye on the tourism numbers, uh, tourism and snowbird numbers. Uh, those are the funnels that drive real estate sales in the busy spring season. And um, from what I'm seeing, it's there's some softness in, um, in the tourism season this year compared to last year. Last year was really a bang up year. Um, this year may be a little softer and that might be a harbinger of, um, you know, perhaps slowing real estate sales, which we're already seeing because of mortgage interest rates, et cetera. But I think, um, you know, tourism is definitely the, uh, the funnel that drives uh, real estate sales in South Florida. And we need to keep a close eye on that as a, as a way to monitor uh, uh, real estate sales uh, this spring. Who doesn't like cheaper airline tickets, and cheaper hotel, or in my case, Airbnb costs? <laughs> Catherine, um, let, let's go to you. How about some parting uh, words of wisdom from the Residential Real Estate Bureau Chief for the real deal? What say you? Um, I would say don't take anyone's word. So <laughs> if you're entering into a new deal, a partnership, starting a new something, just read the fine print, do your research. Um, People always try to come back from whatever, but it's good to to know what you're getting into. So don't take anyone's word. I wonder if there's not a lot of our audience out there who maybe had their money with an entity called FTX, <laughs> which had its signage on the what used to be the American Lions Arena, then became the FTX Arena, and now has reverted back to the very fantastic name of the Miami Dade Arena. So great words of wisdom, Catherine. And then finally. Um, John, what are your parting words of wisdom? And by the way, uh, I was on our YouTube page and I saw some comments in reference to uh, last week's podcast where you were referring to birds. People might remember in our first uh, version of this podcast, <laughs> you used to talk about the uh, birds that attacked you, magpies or so. Now I guess you have a problem with songbirds. So can we get an update on the bird situation? And also, can you give us some parting words of wisdom for our audience? Surely. Well, the bird, uh, the songbirds, uh, they're nice, but they, they're just very annoying waking me up in the morning. And um, it's like having an alarm clock. So I went from one bad scenario to another, uh, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see if we have any comments from our viewers regarding this, because I'm not basing this on statistics, but I've got a real gut feeling that cash buying will begin to wane in dramatic fashion this year because of the real estate pressures, because of the economic pressures. You know, Florida, as John mentioned, you know, it's its own unique entity. We've always got the international buyers um, that come in. But so I don't think it'll be as bad as the rest of the country. But I, I just believe uh, cash buying will begin to dry up dramatically. Wow, that should bring some comments. Anybody yeah. out there who disagrees with John Fackler, the cash buyer is going away at a time when interest rates are going up, meaning the housing market's going sideways. <laughs> please send us some comments, inquiry, condovultures.com. Now, my particular um, uh, perspective uh, uh, I would suggest to you is when you're going ahead and you're looking for properties, pay attention to days on market. Um, if you are working with a realtor or if you are a realtor or if you're looking to invest on your own, pay attention to days on market. Why? Days on market is a great indicator as to sentiment, in my opinion. So if in 2022, the days on market number that it took for a property to be listed, to go into contract and to close, if it was X and now suddenly this year, it's double that. That suggests that you don't have as many buyers lining up to take out these sellers, which means the only way these sellers are most likely going to move their property is to reduce their price. So my takeaway is when you're doing your research, do it yourself or ask your realtor to go ahead and pull some days of market and pay attention to that closely because it's telling you real time what's going on. Much like a happy hour menu will tell you whether or not a restaurant needs you person in the seat or whether or not they're strong enough and they don't need to discount anything. So with that being said, let me go ahead and thank our panel. We got Catherine Kalergis. She is the uh, Residential Real Estate Bureau Chief for The Real Deal. Catherine, if someone wants to reach you, they should send you an email at kk at therealdeal.com. We have Jean Groose. Jean is a former journalist, did it for 25 years. He now has his own public relations marketing firm called Groose Communication. You can go to his website at groussepr.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. And then finally, John Fackler, he now does consulting. He's a former journalist. If you want to get a hold of him, he has a very easy to remember email address, <laughs> jtfny2 at gmail.com, jtfny2 at gmail.com. And I'm Peter Zalewski of Condo Vultures. Again, don't forget to send us a comment, inquiry at condovultures.com. Check us out on traditional uh, podcast formats or go to our video podcast. And until next time, take, take care. Ciao, ciao. Don't buy a South Florida condo discounted or distressed before taking a condo vultures correction tour.
Condovultures.com offers weekly bus and walking tours that focus on educating buyers on the how-tos of identifying discounted condos, analyzing the opportunities, and purchasing units. Every tour attendee receives a list of all condo projects in a particular market, a market assessment handout, and unmatched expert analysis. For more information on the condo correction tours, please visit condovultures.eventbrite.com.